Okay, so uh, the last presentation is uh, a paper that uh, um, that is joint work with uh, my colleague, uh, ex-colleague uh, Piotr Zviernik uh, at uh, UPF, and uh, it's on the identification problem of uh, the new rational expectations models. And um, um, let's see. Um, so, so if you would like the slides, if you'd like to take a look at additional material, simplifying examples, you can find those on my uh, website. Um, um, so without further ado, uh, let's begin with the literature. So as we all know, you know I don't have to explain to anybody here that uh, these models are used uh, all over uh, macroeconomics and finance. However, they are badly identified. And, and this was uh, most recently uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, made into a big issue by uh, Kanavan Sala in 2009, in a JME paper. Uh, they pointed out a number of econometric uh, issues with these models. And in fact, this, is, this paper is part of a project that is trying to uncover the statistical and econometric foundations of these models, one of which is identification but uh, there are other things that also need to be worked out. Um, now, the matter is quite urgent, and a number of very prominent economists have pointed out uh, uh, the, the need to look at identification. Uh, policy is being built on, these, uh, on, these, uh, on, on estimates of these models, and so if, if you're getting bad estimates, you know, that, that, that can have implications for uh, you know, bad policy. So, so, so papers like Pesseron, Romer, Blanchard, uh, sorry, Professor Alan Smith, uh, sorry, uh, have pointed out the, the, the urgency of, 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 of uh, you know, needing to look at this, uh, this problem. Uh, it was surprising uh, to us that, that, in fact, people were well aware of the identification problems uh, from the very beginning. Um, and uh, the father of linear rational expectations himself, uh, Muth, uh, wrote a paper, so, which was published only in 1981, but was actually written around the time of the seminal rational expectations paper, um, looking at identification and pointing out that these models have identification problems. Um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Wallace has also looked at this, Pesseron has looked at this in a, in, in a, in a paper and, uh, and his book. Um, so this is not new as far as um, you know, the literature is concerned. Uh, we're just you know, rediscovering this issue again now that we're using these models much more uh, in policy. Um, so the, the, um, what, uh, what Canova and Salah um, uh, uh, pushed for uh, um, became you know, a new literature on this that was uh, you know, started with the papers by Iskrev and uh, Komunjo and Ang uh, but continued on to a number of papers, uh, uh, including by Dennis and, uh, and, and Marcin and, and, and Andre. Um, uh, however, these papers uh, look at, uh, so we characterize the contribution of these papers as more on the computational side uh, than, than on the analytical side. And what we're interested in, Piotr and I, is trying to find a mathematical description of, of the problem and getting at the source of the problem. Where is this identification failure coming from? Um, uh, so we actually connect more to the literature on Varma. Uh, so this is the literature that you, you can find uh, reviewed in the book by Hannon and Deistler. Um, uh, and it describes uh, in, a, in a very complete way, I would say, um, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the topology of the parameter space, the topology of observational equivalence, uh, necessary and sufficient conditions for global identification, not just local identification, um, um, and so on. Okay, so we want results that do that for linear rational expectations and extend there in a direct way and connect in a direct way to this literature. Okay? Because at the end of the day, linear rational expectations models are an extension of Varma. So any results should connect to this literature. Okay, and, 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 and that's, that's a feature of, uh, of the work that we present here. So what do we look at? We look, we look at uh, a model that looks a bit like a Varma model, but it has expectations. Okay, so it has 
uh, current and lagged values of an exogenous unobserved shock, and it has leads and lags of an endogenous variable. Okay, so the leads are expected, of course, they're not uh, exactly observed. Okay, um, and we're looking at the identification problem from the spectral density point of view. So, similarly to uh, what Dennis and um, um, uh, what Dennis was, was presenting earlier, and also what, uh, what Andre and uh, and Marchin were presenting earlier. Uh, we look at uh, uh, identification from the spectral density point of view, uh, which is sufficient if you're looking at Gaussian data. Um, so you can think of this paper as dealing with a Gaussian case. And in fact, we analyzed this model quite fully, I would say completely. Um, 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 however, with a, with a, with a, um, uh, a particular choice of parameterization that we'll discuss shortly. Okay, so we, we look at uh, identification from the spectral density. We impose stationarity, uniqueness, causality, and invertibility. Okay, so some of these assumptions are stronger than others. We will go in detail through every single assumption, and uh, uh, so, so, so don't worry about uh, you know me glossing over it now. We will spend a lot of time on each of these assumptions. Um, very importantly, we do not assume minimality or regularity, okay? So minimality is uh, something that appeared, for example, in, uh, in Andre and Marchin's paper where they, <clears throat> where they uh, so they imposed it uh, uh, directly, right? Uh, 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 they imposed controllability and observability, um, uh, and it's something that also appears in, uh, in Kamunjal and Aang. Uh, we don't need any a priori assumption of minimality. Uh, regularity is also an assumption that uh, that that can make things uh, quite challenging in certain frameworks. So, for example, the the Komunjan and Ang paper is 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 almost two papers, one for the regular case and one for the singular case. So, what I mean by regularity is there being as many shocks as observables. Okay, uh, we don't need that assumption. Okay, we can work equally with the case where there are uh, uh, fewer shocks than observables, which is the typical case in, in DSGs. And uh, we provide an analytical description of observational equivalence. Okay, so we describe the topology of the parameter space, we describe the topology of observational equivalence, and we find exactly where uh, 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 the identification problem arises in linear rational expectations models. And uh, I, will, I will go through that shortly, what it is, okay? And uh, in detail, okay? But basically, in a nutshell, it's that forward dependence is not identified, okay? So what do I mean by that? So we all know that endogenous variables are not identified, okay? The effective endogenous variables are not identified. You need to impose restrictions, okay? So it turns out that when you have expected endogenous variables, you need to impose more restrictions than you would with just endogenous variables, okay? So it's not that they're not identified ever, okay? They're, you know, your favorite DSGE might have everything identified. That's perfectly fine. All we're saying is that if you have expectations, then you need more restrictions than you typically would in a you know, simultaneous equations model, in a structural VAR, in a structural VAR mask, okay? You just need more because of forward dependence. And we show mathematically why that's the case, okay? And, one of, the th and uh, of course, we provide necessary and sufficient conditions for um, identification under fine restrictions. Um, so whenever I say identification in this talk, I mean global identification. Um, um, uh, we do provide results for local identification, but uh, you know, just, just for completeness. Um, if, you can, if, if you can test for, uh, for global, why, why care about local? But we do that anyway. Um, <clears throat> we also provide, you know, many of these models are, are, you know, have parameters that go into B and A that are functions of so-called deep parameters, um, and they're typically of the rational form. So, so we provide a very general result, result for generic identification if you have an analytically parameterized B and A. So, 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 so you get functions of deep parameters that are analytic. Okay, then, then you can then you can uh, test for uh, not so much identification, but uh, generic identification. Okay, so before I move on to the next slide, there is a question. Uh, so, 
Okay. So uh, there's a question that uh, Paranta says, uh, I don't see forward-looking variables and I'm missing something. Uh, so what I mean by forward-looking variables is the stuff that goes on here. This is a lag operator, okay? It includes positive powers of L, which would indicate past Y, but it also includes negative powers of L, which would indicate uh, positive values, uh, sorry, uh, expected values of Y. So I'll, I'll give an example about this in a, in a second. Okay, so, so don't worry about that. Okay, so in a nutshell, what do we do in this paper? Well, it's best to explain it uh, in a historical uh, context, okay? So in the 50s, when people were looking at ARMA, uh, they discovered that the identification problem boiled down to common roots, right? If you have common roots, so for this ARMA11 is observationally equivalent to this ARMA00, okay? And once you take care of these common roots, once you, you know, assume that I'm away or, or make restrictions that are sufficient to rule them out, uh, then you have solved the identification problem for ARMA, okay? So that, that was figured out in the 50s and 60s. Then people started thinking about vector ARMA, okay, or VARMA, and there, additional complications uh, came about. And you had this issue of unimodular transformations. So it turns out that this VAR is observationally equivalent to this MA1. And that's the case because you can actually find uh, matrix polynomials like this one, whose inverse is also a matrix polynomial, okay? However, it turns out that this is basically the worst that can happen. Okay, and once you rule them out, just like you ruled out common roots, okay, then you have solved the identification problem for uh, Varma. Okay, so what is the additional complication in linear rational expectations? It's just forward dependence and nothing more. Okay, and here I give you an example. This is the Kagan model. Uh, y depends on expected value of Ys and some IID shock. If you solve this, okay, by iterating forward, you get that y is equal to epsilon. So this linear rational expectations model is observationally equivalent to this trivial IID uh, model, okay? And the reason is that this is not identified. This parameter of forward dependence is not identified. It turns out, and we prove this mathematically, okay, that this is the worst that can happen. And once you take care of this, you have solved the identification problem in linear rational expectations models, okay? All of these problems continue to be present because the, the linear rational expectations model is more general than Varma, okay? But the additional complication is forward dependence, and once you take care of it, you have solved the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the problem. And that's basically the main message of, well, one of the main messages of, of this paper, okay? So uh, let's get down to our assumptions, okay? So, so the model that we consider has leads and lags of Y, okay? It has present and lag values of epsilon. We assume that epsilon is IID, mean zero, variance the identity matrix. We assume that the expectational operator is the mathematical expectation operator conditional on uh, the shocks. Uh, B is not a polynomial, okay? Uh, necessarily a polynomial, it can have leads, okay? So that would be indicated by negative powers here, okay? So that would bring in the forward dependence. Uh, and A is just a polynomial, okay? And uh, since epsilon has no um, uh, parameters attached to it, all of the parameters are basically D and A, okay? And we call the parameter space omega, okay? And our restrictions on B and A are three restrictions. First of all, we assume existence and uniqueness. We assume canonical factorization, okay? So we'll discuss what that means in a second. Essentially, it means invertibility, okay? So if you're familiar with fundamentalness or, or the many-phase assumption um, uh, or invertibility, that's what we're assuming, okay? But we'll, we'll talk uh, a lot more about these assumptions uh, 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 in, the, in the coming slides, okay? And uh, L is just finite leads and lags. It's the typical assumption that you have no more than say five leads and three lags or whatever, okay? Just having a cap on, uh, on P, Q, and K, okay? So let's begin with the EU assumption, okay? The existence and uniqueness assumption. Obviously you need existence, otherwise you can't solve, 
okay? Uh, we're looking at causal stationary solutions, okay? So what does causality mean? It means that I'm explaining my data by economic shocks, okay? By technology shocks, policy shocks, liquidity shocks, and so on, okay? Uh, I don't believe that the present depends on the future, okay? The, the present depends on current and past shocks, okay? That's what causality means. Again, not controversial. Stationarity is not a controversial assumption either because typically these models, these linear rational expectations models that people look at are linearized DSGEs. It only makes sense to linearize a DSGE if you're going to remain you know, near a, a steady state, okay? And, and therefore you need stationarity. So stationarity is not a strong assumption, okay? Uniqueness, some people might be uncomfortable with uniqueness, okay? Um, so, there are, I believe, you know, scientific reasons to, to, you know, to leave out the case of non-uniqueness, okay? If, if you write down a model that has a non-unique solution, uh, then your model has failed to explain the observables, right? Uh, but there are also, you know, even if you go uh, in, in the route of trying to interpret, you know, writing down a specific uh, solution in that non-unique space and trying to interpret um, uh, you know, uh, these solutions by, for example, sunspots uh, or animal spirits or, or you know, exuberance or, 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 or whatever, okay? You have some serious econometric problems, okay? So these are, uh, I'll show you a couple of graphs from a paper that, uh, that is in preparation. Um, and uh, uh, so I hope it will be done quite soon. Uh, this is the limiting Gaussian likelihood function okay, analytically uh, uh, computed, okay, of the simplest possible rational expectations model, okay, the Kagan model has a limiting likelihood function that looks like this. This is horrible, okay, there's, uh, you know, there's no other way of, of describing it. This is a horrible likelihood function. This is not, you know, um, uh, something that you see in textbooks. This is, this is not your probit likelihood function. This is not your uh, regular normal OLS uh, uh, likelihood function. This is this is quite bad, and you can you know th this one in, uh, specifically uh, you can prove has a maximum here. Okay, it's barely visible. In fact, it's extremely flat around there, even though there is a unique maximum. Uh, however, if you should find yourself numerically optimizing beginning in this region, you will diverge to infinity in this direction. Okay, so there are econometrically, the point is there are econometrically reasons to rule out non-uniqueness. They have horrible likelihood functions like this. Okay, and of course, this is the limiting likelihood function, but if you, you know, if you take any uh, finite sample likelihood function, it quick, very quickly begins to look like this, you know, thanks to the uniform law of large numbers. Okay, so, so, so you know, even though this is an analytical uh, result, okay, it, it, it's, uh, its implication is clear for finite samples. This is another limiting likelihood function of a different model that has a discontinuity, okay? So something that doesn't seem to be appreciated enough in, in I think, in the DSG literature is that DSG solutions are discontinuous. You can have a, uh, a model, okay, that for a given parameter has a solution, okay? And if you change the parameter an epsilon, okay, no matter how small, then suddenly the solution jumps to something very, very far away, okay? You can have these discontinuities. These continuities uh, exist and they're very well understood in the functional analysis literature. They do not seem to be uh, uh, appreciated well enough in, uh, in, um, in the DSGE literature. But if you have such a model, then you have a likelihood, limiting likelihood function that looks like this. Again, not textbook, okay? The maximum occurs at a point. If you approach from this direction, you go to negative infinity, okay? So really, really, really nasty likelihood functions, okay? If you allow for non-uniqueness, okay? So I think, I hope I've convinced you that non-uniqueness is not where you want to be. In this paper, I provide another solution besides restricting to uniqueness, uh, but that requires a little more uh, uh, work in that direction, okay? For now, let's just stick to uniqueness, okay? In any case, you know, uh, uh, I think in central banks, they typically try to choose priors uh, in the parameters to ensure uniqueness anyway, because they believe that that's what makes sense, okay? So I don't think that's too controversial anyway, but, but I hope I've convinced you anyway. So in order to discuss, um, sorry. 
So in order to discuss um, the identification problem, um, it would be a good idea to spend a few minutes just recalling how these models are solved, okay? So let's begin with the simplest possible model, the AR1. We all know that the AR1, you solve it, uh, you know, if you have an AR1 like this, you just solve it backwards. And you get an expression for Y in terms of present and past values of epsilon, okay? If you have a forward-looking model like the Kagan model, you're gonna solve it forwards, okay? You're gonna iterate forwards and you're gonna get an expression of Y in terms of present and expected values of epsilon, okay? But notice again, the identification problem, okay? Here you have a third, okay? This is IID always. In this, this presentation, it's always IID. Uh, here you have a third, here the third disappears, okay? Again, the identification problem uh, 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 leers it, 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 its head, okay? Uh, but the point of this slide is, for these models, you solve forward, okay? There is a question, I will take it in a, in a, in a, in a second, okay? So what do you do when you have a mixed model? Well, well, when you have a mixed model, you take your lag operator here, and you factorize it, and then you solve first forwards, like the Kagan model, okay? Expressing this factor, in terms of present and expected values of epsilon here, okay? Followed by solving backwards like you did in the AR1 model, okay? And you get this expression for the solution, okay? So when you have leads and lags, then you're going to solve first forwards, then backwards, okay? And now let me take a look at the question. So is it fair to say that uniqueness is achieved by imposing additional restrictions or using additional information? Uh, yes, in fact, that's exactly where we are headed. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, uniqueness is achieved by imposing additional restrictions. Uh, yes, in fact, that's, that's exactly how, it's, um, uh, how it would be um, uh, uh, imposed. And that's a very simple um, 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 check, right? You know, Gensys um, uh, allows you to, um, you know, once you feed into it parameters, it tells you whether you have uniqueness or no uniqueness. It tells you whether you have existence or no unique, uh, or, 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 or no existence, okay? So, 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 so you know, we, we just imagine that you are only considering parameters where you have both existence and uniqueness. And that, of course, comes from imposing restrictions, yes. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll describe fully what these restrictions uh, look like. Okay, so I, I think I will need to, uh, let me see. So Bertil, can you uh, raise your hand so that you can ask your question by audio? Okay, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I just wanted a small, th thank you for taking my question. I just mm -hmm. wanted to ask a small clarification question regarding, um, I guess what I would call controversial information or controversial um, restrictions. Mm -hmm. I can see the situation in your previous uh, exam graphical example where let's say there's a negative uh, solution versus a positive one. And then in that context, maybe it makes economic sense to focus on the positive one. But in a more complex situation, what if um, there are two possible candidates that cannot be ruled out by some simple economic argument? How would you focus on one versus the other? That's the I nature see. of my question. Thank you. Okay. So, so, so basically, uh, we're assuming that you that you that you are not in that situation where you are not in a situation where there are several solutions. Okay, we're assuming right off the bat uh, that there is a unique solution. So, so you will never be in a solution where you have to bring uh, um, um, additional uh, restrictions to bear. Um, uh, the restrictions are exactly the ones that you would that you, that you would get from uh, from. Um, Genesis, for example, okay? Uh, uh, so there's another question from Parantap. Can you raise your hand, please? Yes, Parantap. Uh, yeah, Majid, this is interesting. I'm just wondering, 
about this mixed model that you showed, mm -hmm. you are assuming a uniqueness. Now, if you look at like this characterization by McCallum, he talks about minimal state space representation. Mm -hmm. So I can also, I find another solution where yt is a function of yt minus one and also yt minus two. That could also be another solution, right? So basically, all you are looking at here is a minimal state space representation. And in that respect, you are characterizing the uniqueness. Am I right? OK, so uh, in the case where you have uniqueness, then it doesn't matter how you solve it, whether you solve it by McCallum's method or Sims method or, or, or you know, Binder and Pesseron, they will all give the same solution. OK, so, so we are ruling out non-uniqueness. So you don't have to worry about which method you use. OK. Um, uh, so I hope that answers uh, the, the... Well, then, then it, is, it is equivalent to minimal state space representation. That's it is, yeah. You, you can think of it that way. Yes, yeah. sure. Thank okay. you. Um, okay. So uh, more generally, if you have a, a vector system, okay, what you're going to do is you're going to take uh, B and factorize it into two polynomials, two matrix uh, polynomials, okay? One that you will use to solve forward and one that you will use to solve backward just like you did in the mixed model, okay? And this is a result by Onatsky and myself. Um, uh, so Onatsky worked it out in the stationary uh, uh, setting, which is what we need here. And I worked it out in the non-stationary setting, which you would use if you had co-integration and unit roots. And this factorization is known as, uh, uh, is known as, uh, sorry, is known as a Wiener-Hopf factorization in the functional analysis literature. And it's, it's, it's what we build on. It's what we build most of our results. It's the mathematical foundations, if you like, of linear rational expectations models. So to use, uh, you know, to use this general factorization for the general case, okay, this is the general model that we consider. First, you solve backwards by inverting the B minus, just like you do the Kagan model. And then you invert the polynomial for the backward dependence, just like you did the AR1 model, and you get this solution. And uh, before you write down the final expression, you notice that this is um, current and expected values of epsilon, but expected values of epsilon are all zero because the assumption is that they are IID. And so you're just going to truncate this object, okay? by using the truncation operator that you see very often in the, the classical literature in Sargent, and you see also in the filtration literature in Anderson and Moore and, 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 uh, and so on, okay? So you're just gonna truncate this thing to only pick out uh, 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 non-negative powers of uh, Z or L, okay? So this is the expression for the final solution, and this is what Onatsky found in his 2006 paper. Okay, and this expression is very important for us, um, uh, but there is a, uh, an additional representation which you get by noticing that this B plus is B um, missing B minus, right? B can be decomposed into B minus times B plus, as, as you can see here. B is B minus times B plus, okay? So if we complete that here by dividing and multiplying by B minus, we get B minus, okay? And so you get the expression for the solution for Y as something that almost look like, looks like the solution for Varma, right? In Varma, you have A and you have B and you divide A by B to get the transfer function, okay? Here, you don't divide A by B. You need to do something to A before you divide by B, okay? You need to do something that depends on the forward component, okay, of your, of your uh, model. Okay, so this expression is very important for us and it's what we build a lot of our results on. Okay, but we also, the expression by Onatsky is also important for us because we use it for a lot of the proofs. Okay, and already, we can already show you at this stage where the identification problem comes from. Okay, if you look at the steps that we used in going from the parameters to the transfer function, that involved first computing the Wiener-Hoff factorization and, you know, factorizing B into B minus and B plus, then preparing this object that appears in Onatsky's representation of the solution, okay, taking A and transforming it into this, okay? And then you notice that the final answer is just B plus inverse times this guy, it's just this guy times this guy. So 
you get this by first dropping b minus and then dividing this object by this object. Okay, so essentially what we do, what this uh, expression is showing you is the steps in moving from parameters to solution. Okay, and if you remember, the identification problem is about whether the mapping from this to this is injective, right? And we can analyze the injectivity of this mapping by simply looking at the injectivity of each of these steps, because each of these is a mapping, okay? So we find that the first mapping is injective, so there can be no identification loss at this stage. We also find that in the second stage, there can be no identification loss, okay? It's, it's identified, okay? We also find that this step looks very much like the Varma solution, right? You take a polynomial, this guy, and divided by another polynomial. So at this stage is where you see a lot of the identification issues that come from Varma models. Remember, Varma are a submodel of the linear rational expectation model. So its issues will continue to, you know, will carry over to the linear rational expectations case, okay? The only new facet to the problem when you have forward dependence is phi three, where you drop B minus. And B minus is exactly what, de what determines forward dependence, okay? And this is essentially, well, a sketch of the proof that forward dependence is not identified. The whole object that determines forward dependence gets dropped entirely in moving from parameters to solutions, okay? So this is, this, is basically the theoretical understanding that we get from this uh, from this framework. Okay, the forward dependence is not identified, and again, that doesn't mean that it's impossible to to identify a linear rational expectations model. It just means that you need additional restrictions. Okay, so now let's continue with the uh, with the other um, uh, restrictions. At this point, we we can we can you know I can define what I mean by observational equivalence. Two sets of parameters are observationally equivalent if they have the same spectral density. Okay, and as you can see, the spectral density is a very complicated object. Okay, so it's, it, we need to impose restrictions. And the next restriction is invertibility. Okay, um, uh, because that allows me to, to identify a spectral density with a particular spectral factor. Okay, and this is the best you can do if you have Gaussian data. You can do no better than this. Okay, if you have non Gaussian data, you can do better. Okay, and in fact, we do better. We are, we are writing up um, another paper uh, that looks at the, uh, at the non-Gaussian uh, case, okay? The strongest assumption, okay? And, you know, um, uh, you know we want to put all, all our uh, cards on the table, okay? The strongest assumption that we make is on the first impulse response that we assume that it's canonical quasi lower triangular, okay? So essentially of this form. So you might recognize this form as the SIMS identification scheme, okay? And uh, uh, so, so we're just using the same thing, okay? This is very strong because it doesn't mesh very well with the way people parameterize DSGEs in practice, okay? Um, uh, however, the assumption uh, involves no statistical loss of generality, okay? We still nest everything that has a rational spectral density, okay, whether it's regular or singular. Um, uh, and so we get a full picture theoretically, okay, even if um, the implementation is still something that, you know, um, uh, is not clear at this point. Okay, so what does this assumption CF allows us, allow us to do? It allows us to say that two parameters are observationally equivalent if they have the same transfer function. Okay, and if you call the transfer function for BAC, then A tilde, B tilde will be observationally equivalent to BA if we have this relationship satisfied, okay? And this is an equality of rational functions, okay? So it's an infinite dimensional equation that needs to be satisfied. However, the next assumption that we impose makes things much simpler, okay? So the assumption, basically, again, non-controversial, that you have a maximum number of lags and a maximum number of leads, okay? So maximum number of lags of kappa for, uh, for B and A, and maximum number of leads of lambda, okay? And once you impose this additional assumption, it turns out that your parameter space omega 
looks very much like a subset of Euclidean space. Okay, it's homeomorphic to a subset of Euclidean space, uh, and the interior consists of two connected components. Okay, so it's not open, it's not closed, and it's not connected. Okay, uh, but these properties, these topological properties, many of them are also true for Varma and also for, in fact, the simultaneous equation model. Okay, so a lot of stuff here, a lot of what you see here is just inherited from, uh, from you know, the, the more basic models. Or it's basically, okay, it, it's what you see in the more basic models. So nothing unexpected here. So if we look, dig into observational equivalence a little bit more, this is the equation that determines observational equivalence. And if you look at the Laurent coefficients of each side, okay, they have to match. It turns out that assumption L allows us to take this infinite set of equations that have to match according to this equation and simply restrict attention to a finite number of these equations. You don't have to look at all of these equations simultaneously. You can restrict attention to a finite number. And this again is a te technique that you see all over linear system theory. Okay, so you see it, for example, in, in looking at controllability. Okay, in looking at controllability, you don't have to look at, you know, an infinite sequence of, um, of, uh, of impulse responses. You can, you can restrict attention to um, the size of the, of, of the state, I think, if I remember correctly. Okay, so it's the same idea, basically. And once you look, once you find this uh, maximum number of equations, and once you stack them all together, it turns out, that checking observational equivalence is a matter of checking whether some vector is in the kernel of some matrix. Okay, so we turn a, um, a rational equation, uh, rational matrix equation um, uh, to a linear algebra equation, which is much easier to analyze. Okay, we also uh, provide topological information about the set of observational equivalent models. We also provide its dimension. Okay, its dimension uh, is um, um, uh, is determined by the complexity of the model as determined by the Macmillan degree of the transfer function. Uh, we also determine the dimension of observational equivalence for a generic point in the parameter space. Okay, these numbers, okay, the dimension of, of observational equivalent models basically tell you how many restrictions you need to impose in order to get identification, okay? And here you see the fundamental aspect of, uh, of the problem pop creeping its head uh, 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 again, okay? Because notice that in, in Varma, generically, you only need N square restrictions, okay? You know, all know this from, uh, from structural VARs, you only need N square restrictions, okay? But if you have forward dependence, okay? If lambda is equal to one, so you're looking at one lag ahead, then you have n square additional restrictions that you need to impose for a generic uh, point in the parameter space. Okay, so 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 you need additional restrictions whenever you have forward dependence, and you see it here. Okay. Uh, so now, in most cases, in 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 practice, you have zero restrictions. You have restrictions of the form two parameters add up to one. Um, maybe across equations, okay? All of these have the character that you take your parameters, you multiply by a matrix, and that has to be fi a fixed value, okay? Um, so if you have restrictions of this form, we provide necessary and sufficient conditions for identification. Essentially, you construct a matrix and you check its rank. And if the rank is full, then you have identification. And if the rank is not full, then you do not have identification. And this result is a direct generalization of a result by Deisler and Schrader uh, from 1979, okay? Uh, and that's just a special case of lambda is equal to zero, so no forward dependence, uh, only backwards dependence, okay? Geometrically, so this is the, the other punchline of, uh, of the paper. Geometrically, identification looks like this picture. Every parameter, restricted by affine restrictions lies at the intersection of two subspaces, okay? The first subspaces is determined by your a priori restrictions. So setting this specific parameters to zero, setting linear combinations of parameters to zero, possibly across equations, okay? All of these look like a line that passes through any particular parameter that you choose, BA, okay? 
we also find that every parameter PA, BA, is observationally equivalent to certain other parameters that lie along a subspace, okay? And we fully characterize this subspace. So identification essentially boils down to whether these two subspaces intersect at a unique point or not. If they intersect at a unique point, then you have identification, okay? Again, I, whenever, whenever I say identification, I mean global identification. There's, there isn't going to be a point far away that is observationally equivalent. It's done, okay? Um, one of the interesting things that you get out of this geometric pictures is that local and global identification coincide, okay? So what do we mean by that? Well, when two subspaces intersect, they intersect either at a point or along a subspace. So if you have failure of identification at this point, you will certainly also have failure of local identification. And therefore, local and global identification occur simultaneously. Okay, so in the particular case where you are uh, using uh, affine restrictions, identification by affine restrictions, then it's perfectly fine to use Komunjur and Ang's method of checking, uh, of checking local identification uh, because, because, because of this uh, geometry of, of the problem, because you're using affine restrictions. You, there is not going to be another point far away that is, uh, that is uh, observationally equivalent, okay? And we find that the geometry for uh, nonlinear restrictions are very similar, okay? In nonlinear restrictions, instead of this red line being straight, it's just going to be wiggly, okay? Uh, we also find that in the case where you're looking at, so we also provide results for identification of specific equations, okay? You can find that in the paper. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I, I don't want to go in, into detail. But the geometric picture for identifying specific equations is exactly the same. The mechanics are exactly the same. If there's a matrix whose rank that you check, it's full, you have identification of your equation. Uh, it's not full, then you do not, okay? And this is useful for whenever you are looking at the identification of things like an Euler equation or a, a New Keynesian Phillips curve. Okay, again, you just construct the matrix, check its rank, and that will tell you if you're identified or not. Okay, so this is just a very quick example of how this works, okay? So here I have one lead, one lag uh, of both Y and Epsilon. And um, uh, just looking at the, uh, at the uh, quantities that we computed earlier, we need at least two restrictions. And for this particular case, if we say restrict this guy and this guy, then we have an M matrix that looks like that. Its determinant is C0 and C1 times C1. And so you have that a point like this, a model like this is identified by the restrictions, okay? But a model like this will not be identified by the restrictions, okay? And this again is something that you see in ARMA and VARMA, okay? If you have a, small model in a big uh, model space, you need more restrictions in order to identify it. Okay, and that's, that's exactly what you see here. Okay, so uh, let me just skip to the uh, conclusion. So uh, in this talk, we characterized observational equivalence and given necessary and sufficient conditions uh, for identification for a large class of linear rational expectations models. Um, uh, you know, I, I think the, the consensus uh, um, um, uh, up to, you know, up to the time that, you know, we finished the paper was that, that the problem was too difficult and can, could not be analyzed analytically. And I hope that, you know, this, this will give us all hope that, that, uh, that no, analytical, analytical um, results are possible and we can analyze this mathematically and we can improve on the computational diagnostics that, uh, that you know, that, that we've come up using the theory. Um, uh, so, so I hope that's the main thing that will come out of it, okay? But we, uh, you know, there, there are some open problems um, uh, that I think uh, are deserving of, of uh, the attention of the community. Uh, first of which is, you know, canonical models. So in, uh, in the Varma literature, you have uh, canonical models such as the reverse echelon form. Uh, in VAR models, you have the Sims canonical form, you know, the, the, the Cholesky, that's a canonical form. Um, uh, and so it would be nice to be able to have the same thing for linear rational expectations models. 
where you just take a model out of the box and estimate it directly and not have to worry about identification. Um, so that's an open problem that I think you know uh, the community might be interested to um, to have at least you know for central bankers who don't want to think about identification. Um, our framework does not allow for measurement errors. Okay, uh, many of these models uh, are specified with measurement errors. Um, um, so 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 that is a, a drawback to um, uh, you know to our setup. Okay, but that is something that is not insurmountable. Okay. We, we need to focus on the source of the problem, okay? So at this stage, it makes sense to rule out measurement errors. Measurement errors are, are very well understood in the literature. We have decades of research on it. Um, and so, 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 you know, extending in that direction is probably not, uh, not too difficult, okay? But, but first we need to zero in on the, on the, you know, on the main issue, which is forward dependence. Um, uh, you know, uh, I hope that you know uh, uh, this also. You know, some of the results that we propose here uh, could be used to look at. You know, why are these models typically weakly identified? Um, um, uh, you know, is is it that a certain variable is not varying enough? Is it that a certain parameter is not uh, large enough or small enough? Okay. Um, um, hopefully, the framework that we provide here, the matrices that we provide here, the M matrix. Uh, will allow you to look at, uh, at weak identification, the source of weak identification, the structural source of weak identification uh, in, these, in these DSGs. Um, um, you know, so that's another exciting area to look at. And then there's this, uh, the last assumption on the CF assumption, which uh, I should have deleted because we've already figured out how to get around that. <laughs> so, so, uh, so hopefully that will, that will be out uh, soon in a, in, a, in a paper to come out.